Turn with me in the scriptures to the book of Acts, so we can learn how to act. Chapter 2. Now remember, Jesus has been on the earth for 40 days after his resurrection. It's Pentecost, it's the Feast of Pentecost, so there's probably about a million people from all over Israel that are in Jerusalem. They're there for seven days to celebrate the feast. Three times a year, Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles. Those three times they would come from all over for seven days to celebrate the Lord's feast. While they're in Jerusalem, the Lord has gathered about 500 of his followers. And these are some of the last words that he says to them. I always say so often, you say what's most important last. Right before you're about to leave someone, you always tell them what is most important. And the Lord is about to experience his ascension into heaven. And he says to those 500 followers, don't leave Jerusalem until you receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. For you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. How many of you know we need power? The church needs power. Believers need power. And so he ascends into heaven, and for the next 10 days, they're in the upper room singing and praying in one accord now, over those next 10 days, 380 of the 500 believers, they get discouraged, they get distracted, they leave, they get tired of waiting. And the Bible says 10 days later, on the day of Pentecost, there were only 120 believers in the upper room. Oh, but how many know those 120 went out and changed the known world at that time? Thank God for the power of Pentecost. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 14, Peter was in that upper room. And the Bible says Peter stands up in verse 14 of Acts 2. And he says, Peter standing up with the eleven... Lifting up his voice, he said to them, Men, Jews, and all who dwell at Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to my words. For these are not drunk with wine as you suppose, for it's only the third hour of the day, it's only nine o'clock in the morning. Now, I can tell you this. I used to pastor the church in the north side before we came out here 38 years ago. And right next to our church, there was a bar. And I used to see men 9 o'clock in the morning drunk in the natural. But these men were drunk in the power of the Holy Ghost. That's how I want to get drunk. Amen? And it says... And then in verse 16, he says, but this is that. Somebody say, this is that. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And here's Joel hundreds of years before Christ is ever born. In the Old Testament, he prophesies about an outpouring in the Holy Spirit on the last days. Beloved, I believe that we are living right now in that time and we are going to experience an outpouring of the Holy Spirit before the Lord returns like we've never seen before. And he says in verse 17, and it shall be in the last days. Do you believe we're living in the last days? Says God, 
I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Young men shall see visions and old men shall dream dreams. And with that, back in January on our 21 days of fasting and prayer as we started the year, I always ask the Lord to name and to theme our year. And the Lord said to put the banner over 2019, that this would be a year of outpouring. And I love when God names something because God's name then, he takes on that nature. He said, my name is Jehovah Jireh, and then the Lord provides. He said, my name is Jehovah Rapha, and then the Lord heals. He says, my name is Jehovah Tassid Canoe, and he is our righteousness. His nature is a direct extension and manifestation of his name. So when God put the name outpouring over this year, I said, Lord, I can believe that you are going to, ah, come on, somebody. Pour out your spirit upon us in these last days like never before. Joel prophesied it hundreds of years in advance. And Peter stands up on the day of Pentecost and he reiterates what the prophet Joel said. And I believe, how many believe America needs an outpouring? How many believe our region needs an outpouring? How many believe the church needs an outpouring? How many believe this church needs an outpouring of God's Holy Spirit? Come on, somebody give God a shout of praise. Hallelujah! So go to Matthew chapter 3 with me. Let me share with you what I'm believing for this week. See, I believe our Holy Spirit seminars, they are appointed times. They're, they're, they're set apart. The Bible refers to them as kairos moments. Times when God in heaven invades earth. And that's what I'm asking for this week, a heavenly Holy Ghost invasion. I'm asking God to rend the heavens and come down. Hallelujah. And so in Matthew chapter 3, remember Jesus goes to John the Baptist and he says, I need you to water baptize me. And John, John says, I, I can't do that. Lord, who am I that I baptize you? And the Lord said to him, he said, listen, this is the right time. This is the right place. You just need to fulfill this promise and do it. So John baptizes Jesus. And it says in verse 16, and Jesus, when he had been baptized, how many of you have been water baptized in the River Jordan? Amen. I have. He went up immediately out of the water. And three things happened. First of all, number one, lo, the heavens were opened. Two, the Spirit of God descended. There was an outpouring. See, I believe we we are living under an open heavens. God gave the us as tithers a tremendous promise he said when we bring the tithe into the storehouse where we are being fed and we prove him now says the Lord see if he will not open to us windows in heaven and pour us out a blessing there's not room enough to receive Back in the book of Chronicles, the Bible says there were times when the heavens were like brass. Men and women were praying, but they felt like nothing was getting through. 
Their prayers were hitting a brass heavens and bouncing right back down. And then the Lord says this in 2 Chronicles 7. He said, but oh, if my people, am I talking to any of my people who are called by my name, if we will humble ourselves and pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways, then he will hear from heaven, he will forgive our sin, and he will heal our land. And through repentance and through prayer by the people of God humbling ourselves, the heavens are opened. And the Bible then goes on to say in 2 Chronicles 7 that there is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the people of God. So the first thing I'm believing for, number one, is an open heavens this week. Last month, we spent 21 days in prayer and fasting. And I'm, I just believe we've been digging the ditches for that open heavens. When Jesus came out of the water, the heavens were open, number one. Number two, the Spirit of God descended. And number three, he heard a voice, the voice of God from heaven. How many of you want God to speak to you this week? Does anybody want to hear God this week? Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. We're bringing some very anointed prophetic ministry into the house this week. I'm expecting we're going to hear the voice of God. We're going to hear the Logos preached, and we're going to hear the Rhema spoken. Hallelujah. But God said that we would live under an open heavens. Jesus prayed as it is in heaven. How I many know there's no sickness in heaven? There's no depression in heaven. There's no insomnia in heaven. There's no fear in heaven. There's no pain in heaven. And as it is in heaven, we're praying heaven down onto the earth. Hallelujah. And open heavens. Number two, let's go to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. We talk a lot about this because even though revival is sovereign, and I, I believe that, and we can certainly be assured Satan hates revival. He will do his best to hinder an outpouring. But there are some things you and I can do. I, well, I always say this about God. He goes where he's invited. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come on, somebody. Holy Spirit. Lift your hands and say that with me. Holy Spirit, you are, we ah, you are welcome here. We don't quench him. We don't grieve him. We welcome him. And we create an atmosphere that is conducive for the presence of the Lord to abide and dwell in our midst. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, the Lord, the Lord says, Matthew 16, 18, he says, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And then he says this, I love this. He says, And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. How many know the enemy cannot stop what God's getting ready to do? I said the enemy cannot prevail against the church that is on the move. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And the weapons that are formed against us, they're not going to prosper. Come on, somebody. 
Hallelujah. And then he says this in verse 19. And I will give you the keys. God has given us keys. Now remember, keys in the Bible always represent authority. But I believe God has given us some keys that can unlock an atmosphere for his presence to come in our midst. He says, I will give the keys of the kingdom of heaven to you. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So let me just share with you some keys that I believe God has given to us that can unlock and create an atmosphere. The first key, of course, number one is prayer. Every significant revival in history was birthed in prayer. Every one. And I, I, I just want to publicly acknowledge and thank the intercessors in this house. Those of you that come before the services and you pray and intercede. Those of you that get on the prayer line and you pray and you form just links of prayer and intercession. Those of you that just get in the trenches. I thank God for intercessors. The Bible says you're marked. There's a mark on your forehead. God has marked you to be one who will stand on the wall and stand in the gap. And I appreciate you. I thank God for you because we're not going to see a move of God without prayer. Preceding the day of Pentecost, they were in the upper room for 10 days. And what were they doing? They were singing and praying in one accord. They were singing and praying in one accord. The second key, I believe, is praise and worship. And I'm going to say in an atmosphere of unity. Let's go to Psalm 133 together. I love this psalm. It says, Behold how good, how pleasant it is when brethren, men and women, dwell together in unity. Oh, it is like precious ointment on the head that ran down on the beard, Aaron's beard, that went down to the mouth of his garment, all the way to the skirt of his garment. And like the dew of Hermon, they came down on the mountains of Zion. It says, for there. Somebody shout, for there. For where? Where there's unity. For there, the Lord commanded the blessing even life forevermore when they had dedicated the temple I shared this in the message last week in 2nd Chronicles 5 when the, the singers and the musicians came together as one as one as one and they began to sing, for the Lord is good, and his mercy ah, endures forever. The Lord, Lord, you're good. You start focusing on the goodness of God, and I'm telling you, his glory is going to start to show up. I said, you start focusing on how good God is. Good, Lord, you are good. Lord, you are good. Lord, you are good, and your mercy endures forever. And the Bible says a cloud filled the sanctuary, the glory of the Lord, and they were not able to stand 
because of the weightiness of God's presence. Oh, my prayer this week is that as people come from all over, that God's going to drip oil all over the services. I had someone just tell me yesterday, for years, they, they, the Lord brought them out of a background of drug abuse. But for years, after they were a Christian, their mind was just so tormented. I said, you, you'll, you'll never realize how, how much torment I experienced. No matter what I did, he said, I couldn't get free. He said, I came to a, a Holy Spirit seminar. And all I was sitting was, was sitting there out in the congregation. Nobody laid hands on me. Nobody spoke anything to me. Nobody made any reference. But while I sat under the anointing, I got delivered from that torment. And I've been free ever since and never have been tormented again. Come on, somebody. Come on. Give God a praise. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, while you're sitting right here, pain can be leaving your body. You could be getting delivered from something. The anointing breaks and destroys every yoke. The anointing makes your neck fat so that what you used to wear, it doesn't fit you anymore. That infirmity doesn't fit anymore. That pain doesn't fit anymore. That oppression doesn't fit anymore. Whatever it is, it's broken and destroyed because of the anointing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Linda made reference. Uh, I got a text yesterday from uh, Rabbi Kurt Landry. He, he's all the way out in Oklahoma. But he sent me a text. I, I just want to read, read a portion of it to you real quick. He says, this next week coming up it's going to be a revelatory week it's going to be much revelation taught and caught experienced he said stay alert and I like this he says and be at rest in the spirit just be at rest in the spirit and then he says this be expecting breakthroughs because you're going to experience many breakthroughs next week how many know he's the lord of the breakthrough come on somebody he says and you're going to get words from god I believe we're going to hear God's voice this coming week. And then he says, Shabbat Shalom to all of you. In Jesus' name. Shabbat Shalom. There was another man that told me last week after I preached the message. He went to Monroeville Assembly's early service and then he came here for our 11 o'clock service. And he said, at the early service down at Monroeville Assembly, the pastor got up to preach and he said, I, 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 can't, I can't preach today. God's telling me we just need to worship him because God's getting ready to do something in our region. Come on, somebody. I'm telling you, people are sensing God's up to something. There's a rumbling. I hear the sound. 
I said, I hear the sound. Put your ear to the spirit. Get your ear out of the natural, what the devil's up to. I hear the sound of the abundance of rain. Hallelujah. 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 Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. The third key, and I believe this, it's hunger and desperation. I'm desperate for you, Lord. You know, I, I've been in the ministry over 40 years. I've been a Christian a long, long time. But I'm going to tell you something. I am so hungry for God. I can't wait till tomorrow starts. I'm going to spend... 18 services this week in the house of the Lord. I'm camping out here. I'm putting my tent in. I'm going to ask God to come and tabernacle with me. I want to get a hold of God because I am so hungry and desperate for more of God like I've never seen before. Hallelujah. Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, he said, Blessed are those that hunger and thirst, for you'll be filled. But then over in Luke, he says this, But woe to you that are full. I never want to get to the place where I feel like I've heard it all, I've experienced it all, I've read it, so many times I've been to church so long I never want to get to the place where I feel like I'm full I'm desperate I am so desperate for God is anybody desperate here today with me hallelujah hallelujah and then the fourth key and we've been talking a lot about this it's simply expectancy Expectancy is the breeding ground for the miraculous. I'm expecting God to do some things this week like we've never seen before. Lord, amaze us. Amaze us. In, in Mark 2, when they let the, the four friends let the man down in, in the house and Jesus healed the paralyzed man, the Bible says when he got up and he was healed, the people said they were amazed. And they said, we've never seen anything like this. God, show us stuff. We can say, we've never seen anything like this. Oh, come on. Come on. Hallelujah. And then the third thing. God promised in Acts 2 and in Joel 2 that when he would pour out his spirit on all flesh, he said this, your sons and your daughters. The third point I want to make is it it's a generational blessing. See, God's not only going to touch us. He's going to touch our children. Come on, somebody. Our grandchildren. He's going to touch that next generation. I am absolutely positive convinced the reason the enemy is working so hard against our sons and our daughters and our grandchildren is because they are going to experience I'm going to call it a double portion of what we are going to experience in these days hallelujah I believe Sean and Krista Smith and I can't wait for them to get here they prophesied last year that our youth, our children were going to have a revival. I'm claiming that outpouring on our sons and on our daughters. 
Some of you, your, your children are grown up and they got children of their own. But guess what? No matter where they are and no matter what they're into, God is going to pour out his spirit on our sons and on our daughters. He's going to deliver them. He's going to heal them. He's going to set them free. Our children have a destiny and they will fulfill it. Hallelujah. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38 and 39, Acts 2, 38, Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You will experience the outpouring. And then he says in verse 39, For this promise is to you, and it's to your children. And it's to all those afar off. And as many as the Lord our God shall call. This generation of young people, I believe before the Lord returns. See, many of them grew up in church. Many of our children grew up in a Christian home. But let me tell you what they need. They need an encounter with God. They need a Holy Ghost God encounter. And if you don't have any natural children, everybody has spiritual children. I believe God is going to pour out His Spirit on this next generation one generation shall speak and tell the next. In Isaiah 44 and verse 3, the Lord says, Isaiah 44, 3, I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. And then he says, I will pour my spirit on your seed. I like this. And my blessing on your offspring. I prophesy the generational blessing that God's going to pour his spirit on our seed and his blessing on our offspring. I'm ready for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit like we've never experienced before. This past week, we had flooding torrential rain, rivers overflowing, roads closed, all kind of waterfalls like we've never seen. But here's what the Bible says, as it is in the natural, so it's going to be in the spirit. When all that flooding was going on, I said, Lord, I'm ready for you to do that in the spirit now. My brother, Andy, grabbed me and he said, I want to show you something. We've been here for 38 years. I've never seen in 38 years. Took me out to the center courtyard and there was, there was a layer of water, had nowhere to go. The drains are filled. The, 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 the sewers are full. There was no place for the water to go. And my wife said, you know, last week I talked about dig the ditches because we're standing on the water right now. It's under our feet already. And she said she watched Perry Stone preaching on how the river of God starts at the throne, but where does it flow? Down through the sanctuary. God's getting ready to flow through this sanctuary with a river of God. 
a river of life. It went up to his knee, his ankles, then up to his knees, then up to his waist, and then it got so deep he couldn't stand or navigate it anymore. And I said, oh Lord, I am ready for an outpouring of the spiritual water like we saw an outpouring of the natural water. Hallelujah! God said it. I believe it. And I'm expecting it this week. This week. Stand on your feet with me.